Welcome to This Is Football. Bienvenidos a This Is Football. We have a very special episode here. We have a very special guest for you guys today. The one, the only, Hercules Gomez. Herc, thank you so much for being on. First and foremost, uh, how are you? I I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? Uh, Nico, Danny, Tony. I'm in LA right now. It's finally the first sunny day uh, in todo, quiero decir el mes, maybe the last few weeks. So it's been a good day. That's good. Awesome. That's good. Bueno, acá awesome. hace, hace mucho que no llueve, así que... Eh, mucho calor en Miami. Sí. <laughs> bueno, y cuando sí. no. Y cuando no. Eso sí. Exacto. Es la diferencia. Exacto. Ustedes son húmedos. Aquí es más seco. Sí. Y hey, eso sonó un poco agresivo. <laughs> no. Bueno. La ciudad, la ciudad. Sí, cada sí, quien sí. Se pone <laughs> no nos andes espiando, por favor, en especial a Dani. Pero bueno, sigamos. <laughs> bueno. All right. So let, let, let's get right into it. Uh, let's get into it in English. And, and this will be back and forth like we talked about in English and Espanol. Ahí vamos, eh, los, los cuatro somos bilingües, así que, eh, bueno, let's get into it. So yesterday, big news came out on, on the USA national team. Um, Henri apparently is, is one of the leading candidates. And then some news came out earlier today about uh, Patrick Vieira being a, a top candidate. Um, you know, what, what do you think about that news? What do you think about both of those candidates? And um, what do you think about, the, you know, U.S. men's national team in general? All right, so... U.S. soccer hasn't named them as candidates. They, they've said nothing to the extent. It's pretty much just uh, they're free uh, and have interest, or at least Thierry Henry has interest. He's, he's expressed that in his broadcast. And for pre-ESPN sources, he actually turned down the France job for the women's team um, that's available in this upcoming World Cup in July because he has interest with the U.S. men's national team. So, so there's that. Patrick Vieira just got let go with Crystal Palace, so there's still – no official word whether he's interested, whether U.S. soccer is interested. Um, two very interesting candidates. Patrick Vieira already has a, a little bit more um, managerial success and more of a, a proven track record in the limited space that he's had. Uh, and also uh, knowledge, conocimiento de, de, de panorama in, in U.S. soccer, the landscape. And Thierry Henry, well, not not so much success. He was a he was a coach. Um head coach of Monaco and they did very bad. It was something like four wins, five draws, 11 losses. I think it was, um, he had a rough go. He, he left that team. He went to Montreal, didn't necessarily succeed with Montreal, ended up leaving the team. He cited family reasons. It was during the pandemic. <clears throat> I'm sure we could all understand that. Um, and then he was with the Belgium, you know, national team as assistant coach. That's his managerial career. He's a great footballer. Both were great footballers. Um, but you're not aiming to have just, a great representative you're aiming to have a great coach and, and the u.s men's national team is at a stage where it could ill afford not to get the coach right it's it's arguably the the biggest sporting moment in the program's history um you could say 1994 because the inception gave major league soccer you know its birth and what it is today um it, it gave it the opportunity to hit the ground running until this day it's still the most you know uh, successful world cup in terms of finances in terms of ticket sales in terms of attendance etc etc so uh, but this could be bigger so it's very important and it's in your backyard along with canada and mexico and you have a real opportunity to to make a run with a very young exciting group so you need to get the the head coaching hire right so they're two they're two candidates in the minds of everybody but u.s soccer has not come out and said anything and, and, and the only one who's really expressed interest is thierry henry and patrick Vieira is very fresh i mean this morning i woke up to the news Right, right. That's why that's why yeah. I kind of put it out there. Yeah, definitely. I, I wanted to get to that topic because I know that those are candidates. However, I wanted to know who will be your candidate because, like, like you said, those, those are very fresh candidates. But at the same time, do you feel like we need somebody from overseas, or do you feel like we can get someone from within the MLS? Si estuviera en tus manos la decisión, no? Yeah, uh, it's difficult, and the reason it's difficult is because. Um, What's the budget like, right? Um, if you're saying, hey, you've got the $1.6 million that Greg Berhalter has and that's it, <laughs> it's going to limit your field to probably major league level type of coaches. Um, I believe this national team has outgrown that type of coach and you need a coach that commands a different type of respect, um, a European pedigree, if you will. Uh, so if you're telling me you have the $14 to $16 million that Mourinho makes a year, I think Mourinho is a very exciting candidate. I think Mourinho gets you out of bed. I think Mourinho 
um, maybe doesn't have the track record with young players, um, but is a no bullshit type of guy. And these things that happen with the Reynas and the Berhalters wouldn't happen with, with Jose Mourinho. And he's a coach that pr- probably played to your strengths. This is a very young group that is fast in transition, very exciting players on the wing. Um, the U.S. has been notoriously, or historically, I should say, uh, prominent in set pieces. So you could probably do something with Mourinho in that style. Um, and you could play a style that was Aiken that we saw to Morocco. You know, Morocco, tough defensively, sound, very exciting going forward in transition, took their moments and, and set pieces, and then they made a semifinal run. There's no reason why the U.S. shouldn't think quarterfinals at least and potentially like we have our bar in a semifinal in your home country. With, with that pool, it doesn't mean it's the best pool on earth, but it means it doesn't mean you can't do something like Morocco. I firmly believe that. It's just it's just the, the direction and, and it's where you want to go. So it depends. If I had my, my money, if I had the money to play with, I would pick a Mourinho type. Um, but if you only have the 1.6 million to play with or maybe two, it's going to limit the opportunities or the, the candidates drastically. That's the only one um, guy that you have in mind right now? Mourinho? I had, I had Zinedine Zidane, but these guys, uh, they got to want to be with the U.S. Men's National Team as well. And the only one who's expressed interest, um, there's been a couple expressed interest, I guess, air quotations, right? Jose Mourinho and Pep Guardiola. But what's it going to take to get those guys out of bed and, and to come? And there's a lot of things that need to change in U.S. soccer to, to get those guys. Um, a Jose Mourinho or Pep Guardiola <laughs> coming to the fold, they're going to want to pick where they live, right? They're not going to say, oh, I'm okay with you making me live in Chicago. And Chicago's an amazing city, but a, a lot of these candidates, they want to pick where they live. And if they want to live in Miami or they want to live in New York, you know, which Pep Guardiola, I believe, has, has an apartment there, th- then so be it. Let them live where they want. But right now, every single person working in the Federation has to live in Chicago. And who knows if they'll have to live in Kansas City a few years down the line when you know the, the training center gets built and when the headquarters may be Kansas City. So who knows? Um they, I, I, need, I want a big name. Um, you need a person that commands respect from this group who doesn't take shit, who has been there, done that, who can build a program, and who can play to the strengths of, of your player pool. Um, and, and right now, I think they've outgrown Major League Soccer coaches. The, the fallback option may be that it's Jesse Marsh, that Jesse Marsh is somewhere in between the two names that I gave you or the two sets, the MLS coach. Yeah. Uh, you know, who, who was Greg Berhalter, the Jim Curtins of the world, the Peter Vermees of the world. And these names I gave you, like Zidane, Pep, and Mo. there's probably an in-between or somewhere in between, and that's probably Jesse Marsh. But, but football is about form, uh, and form is important. And his last two stints in, in the Bundesliga with, Bundesliga with Leipzig and in the Premier League with Leeds left a bad taste on a lot of uh, the people who have supported him in their mouth because uh, he didn't necessarily do too well. So maybe it's in between, and maybe you see something like a Jesse Marsh and his best friend Jim Curtin, head coach of the Philly Union, combo for 2026. Um, I have my doubts just because of their style. Uh, it's it's very high-press, up-tempo, uh, chaotic, and it's very rarely a plan B. I guess I see, yeah. So it, it'll be difficult. Um, but that's probably what ended up happening. It'll be somewhere in between. Right. And so yeah. th- we had sorry, Chelo sorry, Bal- go ahead. No, 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 no worry, Tony. But so we had Chelo Balboa on a few weeks ago, and he said he said exactly what you said. First would be Jesse Marsh. Um, you know, he thinks the U.S. should go and make a splash. Um, I'm with you. Uh, I, I think you know this is the perfect opportunity to make a splash. But there's a couple of tidbits that go against that. First. There hasn't been a coach uh, like a, a coach from an international, you know, an international coach win a World Cup with uh, with a team like that that they're not from. So could that happen? You know, with the U.S., could the U.S. be the first one to do that? Maybe. But well, I mean, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, you know, well, tidbit there. Uh, how many, Danny? How many teams have won the World Cup? There's a reason I mean, the same few. teams won the World Cup. You know, just as recently you had Spain. That 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 was it. But it's been the Brazils, the Argentinas, the Germanys. The Italy's and recycle. France. I'm not even going to count Uruguay. You know, Uruguay was a you know a couple of those were Olympic titles. So so it's the same teams over and over that win the World Cup. So this no manager who's been not born in that country has not won a World Cup is is a 
it's a it's a dumb exercise for me, and I hear it all the time in deportes in Spanish, and we hear it. No, tiene que ser mexicano. No, tiene que ser de aquí. No somos nadie. We're nobody in the world. And, and sí, the, the sí. moment we recognize that and we're humble enough and we have the humility to go forward and be like, maybe there are things we can learn from other cultures, footballing cultures especially. I don't care if the manager is Brazilian, German, Argentino, or American. The U.S. isn't winning the World Cup. Not today. That's a reality. So, so let's get that out there. And, and the U.S. historically has done nothing. Nobody in CONCACAF has done anything to say you need to have a coach of a certain birthplace, race, gender, out the window, porque we're, we're nobody. Oye, Hércules, ahorita que estás tocando ese tema y que tú fuiste un exjugador precisamente de la selección de Team BSA, siendo sinceros, entre ustedes, inside, ¿hubo alguna vez esta plática de este, este coach sí porque es eh, de USA? O este no, porque es argentino, mexicano, uruguayo, lo que sea. ¿Alguna vez hubo esta plática entre ustedes, sinceramente? Para nada. Un nicho. Pues, no, nunca. Me, me tocó dos técnicos, uno americano, Bob Bradley, lo más americano que puede ser, sargento, drill sergeant, you know, very, uh, muy disciplinado a sus modos, eh, militar. Eh, a Jürgen, Jürgen Klinsmann, que era más espíritu libre, que era más no tan táctico, era más de motivar, era más de, de, de legar, de, de, de hacer cosas de una manera muy distinta, hasta tampoco de estilo alemán, honestamente. Eh, y nunca era como, se tiene que ser de, de esta raíz, tiene que ser de, de, de este país, tiene que ser de este estilo. O sea, estamos en una infancia nosotros con el fútbol en Estados Unidos y tenemos que entender eso. Tenemos jugadores muy importantes para nosotros que han jugado en la Premier League, que estaban en la Bundesliga, que estaban con técnicos importantes. Pero hoy en día, y siempre lo digo, eh, se habla de lo verde que es este equipo, de lo joven que es este equipo de la selección de Estados Unidos. Era... Eh, y sí, tienes razón, el pool es muy verde. Pero ¿saben quién es el más verde? Era Greg Berhalter. Porque mientras esos jugadores llegan de, de Chelsea, llegan de, de Barcelona siendo jóvenes, llegan de Man City siendo jóvenes, llegan de Leipzig siendo jóvenes, Greg Berhalter llegó joven del Columbus Crew. Si me entienden, es verde. Entonces, de repente tienes el pool. Tiene jugadores que han tenido a Jose Mourinho como técnico, a Pep Guardiola como técnico, a Xavi y Kumen como técnico. Eh, los mejores técnicos del mundo en los mejores seteos del mundo en los setups del mundo y de repente van a llegar al pool de Estados Unidos y le vas a poner a cualquiera no, va a responder, no van a responder, responder de, de la misma manera, es una realidad claro sí, no, no, sí. de acuerdo go, go, going, going into what, what you're mentioning about those players uh, I'm taking the next step further you know, next World Cup, we have the World Cup here you know, it's, it's a very important for us Uh, what will be a reasonable uh, result <coughs> as, as far as as far as you know the, the 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 type of team that we have? Because this World Cup, we we saw we missed last World Cup and now we made this World Cup. We made a bit a little bit of noise. The team played very well in a few games. Unfortunately, we we got bounced by by the Netherlands. However, you know we, we saw some key pieces there. Uh, what will be a reasonable result for the next World Cup? You know because we we can consider this one the golden generation if you want to say on paper. On paper, on paper. For, me, it's, for me, for me, it's like generation de cristal because they've not been able to to <laughs> stay fit and prove they could stay on the field. Um, but certainly, on paper, it's the most talented generation uh, that the U.S. Uh, men's national team has had. That's that's a reality, I and mean, it's not even debatable. Um, but it's el sexto partido, not el quinto partido. But it's the same bar. It's the quarterfinal game minimum. Something that's been done in 2002 and not been replicated since 2002 but since 2002 you've done things to show that you've grown since 2002 that that bruce arena quarterfinal run where you were a handball a missed handball torsten frings uh, against germany you know on the line greg berhalter hits it hits him in the hand it should have been a penalty and then you go on to a semifinal appearance instead of that um you stayed there but you've done good things since um the u.s men's national team has gotten second place in a confederations cup they ended spain uh, a 35 game unbeaten streak that spain had uh that spanish national team that ended up winning two euros in a world cup sandwich in between 
los frenaste. You, you, you ended that run in the Confederations Cup. You made it to the final and you had Brazil at halftime 2-0. You've made strides. 2010 World Cup, a World Cup that I was part of, the first ever U.S. Men's National Team to win a World Cup group. You know, I, I still remember heading into that group. Um, the, the, the headlines in the English press and the British press were easy. And it was E, England. It was A, Algeria. S, Slovenia. And Y, Yanks. Easy. That was their group. It was the U.S. that won that for the first time in its history. So you've made these strides. But then you went backwards by not qualifying. And then this last World Cup, the only team that you beat was Iran. So you need to, at home, prove that you can be the team that everybody expects. And the quarterfinal is the minimum. Anything else would be a disaster, would be a fracaso. There it is, quarterfinals. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, going back, well, to, I mean, going back to, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, for semifinals, I think that's the minimum you have to get right, to right, the right, quarterfinals. Right, right. That would yeah, be with right. the new expanded World Cup. That would be six games for them. Right. Yeah, go, going to going to what you said, your experiences with the U.S. We wanted to show you a picture, and we wanted to see what this picture represents to you, and, and to give us a little bit more insight of what happened that day. You know, uh, it's a it's a famous picture. You know, <laughs> you have it posted on. On your social media. Mm, Nebo un poquito, no? <laughs> <laughs> so, un poquito, this is un funny. Poquito. This is funny because this is this is in Denver, Colorado. And uh, I, I played the very first game in this stadium. I actually scored the very first goal in this stadium. And anybody who's ever lived in Denver knows that it, it's going to snow probably until April, right? This game's in March. And there's a blizzard going on. And that field's supposed to be heated underneath. So it's supposed to defrost, you know, a lot of that snow. Imagine how much snow was pouring down that even with the heated field, you could see me bodying somebody shoulder charge, like hitting them with the shoulder. And he's like in a foot and a half of snow and you can barely see the ball. Um, I still remember, I don't know if you guys remember it, but the last time the U S was in a major crisis, a sporting crisis before they didn't qualify, I should say um, was this game. We had barely qualified <laughs> we had barely qualified to the hexagonal to play in the hex. The world cup qualifying before it was the last game of the round. And we were playing in Antigua and Barbuda in a cricket field. And there was a monsoon and we were losing one zero. We needed to win this game or we're not going to the hex. It was, it was, I don't know how we were allowed to play on this game. It was flooded. You couldn't move the ball. Eddie Johnson and Alan Gordon came on as subs and it was two Eddie Johnson goals in like the final 10 minutes and we won the game. Jurgen Jurgen was like you know water deep up into his chin like he, you know it was he was an, under immense pressure uh, it was a difficult situation and that was the first game of the next round and the press was all over us because right before that game during camp there had been um, a sporting news una nota de sporting news um with Brian Strauss, where he cited anonymous sources, a lot of different like sources at an MLS media day. And they were complaining about Jurgen and his tactics. They were complaining about the national team. So that was one of the first times the U.S. Men's National Team ever had pressure. So this game, we needed to start off the right way. I mean, Clint Dempsey scored early on in the first 20 minutes and uh, about 50 something minutes in, they had stopped the game um, because there was too much snow and they wanted to talk to both teams the captains and the coaches to see if we continue before they did that before they stopped the game i remember we scored first but we were holding on for dear life and los ticos you know behind us travesaño poste <laughs> brad guzan i think it was brad guzan big save here big save there like we were lucky to be one zero it could have been three one them easily i think they even got a goal called back so the 50th something minute when they ask Los Ticos, Los Capitanes, and the head coach, and I remember Pablo Anchope, because I go over there, hablo español, I go over there, and they're thinking, they're, this is what they're saying. No, mi madres, mi madres, we're going to keep playing. No vamos a parar esto. Tenemos estos gringos exactamente donde los queremos. We got them exactly where we want them. Keep playing, keep playing, keep playing. We finish the game, 1-0, we win. Massive victory for us. Snow Clásico, historic, you know, legendary game. After the game, they start complaining how they're going to protest to the press. Uh, they can't believe this game was allowed to be played. And I'm sitting there. I'm like, quisieron jugar. O sea, cuando pensaban que nos podían ganar, no había problema. You know? We won. And all of a sudden, there's a problem. 
Típico, ¿no? Oye, Típico. Y, y se convirtió en la primera vez en la historia de, 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 de deporte en que un equipo ganó y practicó dos deportes a la vez, ¿no? Creo que fue el esquí sobre nieve y fútbol, ¿no? <risa> Yo me acuerdo, me acuerdo que de Marquez Beasley estaba jugando por el lado, el sector izquierdo como lateral a ese partido, y yo como volante izquierdo, como winger. Eh, y me acuerdo en el segundo tiempo, eh, de Marquez y yo para avanzar el balón, like to advance the ball, we started juggling and lifting the ball to each other and playing it back and forth. And I remember Clint Dempsey after the game saying, man, I couldn't do anything. I was just looking at you and DeMarcus juggling. <laughs> <laughs> and he, was, he, was, I mean, he scored the goal, but he was laughing about it because it was so crazy. Yeah, it was so, so crazy. I, now we are... Compare, oh, sorry, sorry, Tony, but how no, do you compare ahead. that to the game that, that, that they just played this past year? Uh, I believe it was against, I think it was Honduras or some, somebody where they played in like 20 degree Minnesota. weather. It was like, yeah, it was, yes. that was crazy. Um, how do you compare yes. that to that game? Well, it's one thing to be cold. It's another thing for it to be unsafe or dangerous. And if they would have stopped that game, the Snow Clasico, you can't say anything. I mean, you, you could barely advance the ball at times. Um, the images of that game were, were insane. It, it's, an, it's an iconic game. It's legendary. Um, I don't think that game happens again today. Uh, so it's very difficult to compare. It's one thing to be cold, but when the conditions are unsafe, that, that's another thing. And you could say that you were borderline unsafe there because, I mean, I had a beard like I do now. I grow out a beard like every winter, right? And I had icicles on that beard. I, my, my skin was just red, red, red. Like it was almost like ice burnt. Um, it was a difficult situation. At times, it was like hard to breathe. You couldn't really run full speed. You felt like you were playing with weights on your body. The ball wouldn't advance. The ball was heavier. Um, visibility was was not there as well. So I, I don't think that game gets played again today. Uh, Hercules, Hercules, I have a tough question for you. I don't know if this is a tough question, pero um, de la llegada de un tiempo para acá, de generación de México-americanos, ¿crees que la selección mejoró a partir de la llegada de estos México-americanos? ¿O es lo mismo? ¿O ¿Cuál es tu perspectiva? ¿México-americanos de mi generación o, o antes? Porque había los hey. Marcelo Balboas. Claro. Yo creo que, yo creo que el México-americano, méxico estadounidense no, no ha cambiado la selección tanto. Eh, creo que seguimos esperando ese jugador superestrella, ¿no? Creo que lo más cercano que ha llegado es Ricardo Pepi, por lo que ha hecho. No le fue bien en la Bundesliga con Augsburgo. Eh, le ha ido muy bien con Groningen. Eh, está peleando el título de goleo en Holanda. Eh, es un jugador muy interesante. Tiene 20 años de edad. Debió de estar en el Mundial. No estaba. Eh, pero nuestra gente, los chicanos, seguimos esperando ese, ese crack, esa estrella. Y, y siempre... Mejora, ¿no? Era. Y no, ni, ni debe ser los mexicanos, los de habla hispana, eh, porque vemos lo que era Marcelo Balboa, ¿no? Marcelo Balboa abrió las puertas, eh, nos mostró que era posible, Hugo Pérez, eh, Tab Ramos, mismo Claudio Reina, eh, pero de México americanos aún falta. Creo que me fue bien en México, eh, gané trofeos eh, colectivos. Campeonatos Liga, Copa, Conca Champions, fui Mundial de Clubes, eh, individuales, campeonato de goleo, aquí lo pueden ver, cosas así, eh, pero falta como esa superestrella y, y estamos esperando. ¿Puede ser Ricardo Pepi? Ojalá. ¿Fue importante para la selección? Sí. Pero para decir que algo ha cambiado, no ha cambiado en muchos sectores o factores y creo que aún falta ese jugador para que cambie. ¿Pudiera ser Alejandro Sendejas que recién lo convocaron? Eh, difícil porque me parece un jugador fantástico y para mi gusto no es winger, no es, no es extremo, es, es más interior. Eh, con Necaxa jugó de, de, de doble seis y de ocho y fue el líder de, de goleo de los jugadores mexicanos en un, eh, en un año futbolístico, ¿no? en el calendario futbolístico. Muy interesante, eh, pero está peleando para entrar al roster y, y de entrar al roster a, a ser parte del once titular y creo que con la selección mexicana pues pudiera ser parte de su once titular, sin duda. Vemos los 34 jugadores que nombró Diego Coca y, y puede, puede pisar los talones de cualquiera. Eh, 
tiene sus chukis, sus tecatitos, pero no van a estar ahí por siempre. ¿De ahí qué? Piojo Alvarado, Diego Laines, Antuna, en el sector interior, ¿quién? Charlie Rodríguez. O sea, realmente la están rascando porque no tienen esa exportación. Sendeja es un jugador que puede ir a, al extranjero fácil y creo que es la meta de él. He hablado con él un par de veces y, y creo que lo tiene bien fijo de dónde quiere estar. Me encanta esa mentalidad. Él está eligiendo tal vez el camino más difícil para llegar, que es la selección de Estados Unidos, pero lo hace porque tiene una fe enorme en sus habilidades y, y, y sabe que el programa de una u otra forma le puede ayudar a lograr los objetivos y los sueños que tiene. Eh, pero para decir que va a ser el salvador, creo que lo más cercano en este momento es un, un Ricardo Pepi porque está anotando goles en una liga donde dan el salto a otras ligas de mayor prestigio. Entonces, eh, creo que lo más cercano es, es Ricardo Pepi en este momento. Pero hay una generación, una camada de jugadores méxico estadounidenses eh, muy interesantes que pueden dar ese salto, ser ese jugador o tener una experiencia increíble en el extranjero. Sí, sí. Claro. Bueno, siguiendo con, con ese tema, a little bit about kind of like how... The, the development of youth soccer. So how, how do you see how the, how the development of, of youth soccer has changed from when you were coming up in the ranks uh, to how it is today? We see a lot more academies today versus back then. Back then it was more, you know, you, you had to stand out in, you know, high school, ODP, and then you got a college scholarship, and that was kind of the way. Now it's more if you're not in an academy, it's very, very tough to break, you know, break the mold. So, how, how, w w you know, how do you feel about that? Like, you know, can you comment about that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's difficult because I'm, I'm thinking about when I was growing up, the avenues for first team football, and that's ultimately what it's about. How do you get to first team? How do you get to Primera División? And they were they were limited. You know, I lived in Southern Nevada, uh, Las Vegas, and, and I played club soccer. When you play club soccer and it's time to play high school soccer, you stop playing club soccer. And and you'd only do high school soccer and it was diluted. Not the best talent played high school soccer. And from there you'd get recruitments to hopefully recruitments to colleges. I had zero recruitments. I had zero people looking, um, you know, at me in that way. And then there was ODP camps that you would have to pay for like these, you know, ODP camps are one day mini camps. It's like a hundred dollars. And, you know, my family didn't have the money to, to pay for these camps to, to, to keep moving forward. And, and you were in a pay to play system. Um, if not for, if not for one of my best friend's parents who was, you know, the team manager, so to speak, what he did was he cut a $25,000 check, you know, for, for us to not to have to pay for a single thing. So we'd have hotel rooms, we would have um, tournaments paid for, fees, all these different things. And I was one of three Latinos on the, on the team, you know. Um, it's very difficult to, to, to back then to find an avenue for first team. They didn't have these academy programs. When I started with the Galaxy, Um, they found me playing USL in San Diego, and, and they kept their eye on me. And after their season, I scored 17 goals. They, they invited me to come train with them, and there was a player who tore his ACL. Like, literally that week, there was an open spot, and they signed me, and I'm 19 years old. Um, the second youngest player on the team, I think, was Alejandro Moreno at 22, 23 years old. And it was unheard of, you know, to get to the first team if you didn't play college soccer and go through the draft. That's all changed now. Um And I think it's interesting because I'll use Mexico as, as an example. Um, if you're a Mexican player, the chances are you solely develop or you solely rely on Liga MX if you want to go to first team or abroad. Like if your goal is to go to Europe, if your goal is to go to the national team, Europe makes that easier. You depend on Liga MX. Um, you don't depend on a certain thing in the United States now and, and, This is what I mean. You have club soccer, and we've seen players go from club soccer to the national team, youth national teams, and then abroad. Josh Sargent was playing at Gallagher in St. Louis and ended up going to the Bundesliga after a good U-17 tournament. You have college soccer, and then you can go abroad. We've seen many times college soccer players go from college abroad. You have players with in Major League Soccer who have – on their own merits they can go abroad or they have a dual passport uh european uh you know passport and they can go abroad it makes it easier or they're in a setup like like the city group or or like red bull where they have a partnership with these teams abroad and they can go abroad or you can see that you're part of these academies that are 
in the continental United States, like the Barcelona Academy, and you see Matthew Hoppe going from the Barcelona Academy to the Bundesliga. You see Julian Araujo, a Mexican national team who was in the Barcelona Academy, and he's used that connection somehow to get to, to Barcelona with his good play with the Galaxy. So there's all these different avenues of getting for the first team in the States. And you even see USL. Josh Winder just went to Benfica. $1.5 million sell yesterday from you know Louisville City. And they're going to Europe, whereas in Liga Mekis, these Mexican players, they only depend on Liga Mekis. And when they depend on Liga Mekis in a league full of foreign players that occupy a lot of opportunities, well, it's very difficult. So so my experience was very difficult. It's probably more akin to the experiences we see now in Liga Mekis. Yeah, definitely. I, I wanted to stay on that topic and, and primarily talk about the homegrown players. Uh, we had a chat the other day with a former colleague of yours, Greg Garza, and uh, he was mentioning the fact that it's the 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 hardest part for a homegrown player in the MLS is not getting that first contract. It's, however, maintaining themselves and getting that possibility to maybe get a second contract. Why do you think that happens? I think it happens all, all over the world. Um, the easy part is making the team. The hard part is staying on the team. I'm I'm I played. I'm 40 now. I played for 17 years professionally. And by no means was I the best player in my region growing up. Was I the best player on any team that I played uh, professionally? Um, but I kept going. And it was like a steady, you know, uphill accession and, and accession. And there were players who were better players, more talented players who had uh, better odds of, of going longer. Played one year. Played three years five years and maybe that's it that's what they're that's what they get that's what, what they had in them for, for whatever the circumstances were because they they couldn't figure out how to maintain themselves because they got injured because of whatever the situation circ circumstance would be they fell off and you hear this all the time it, it's not about making it it's about staying there it's about being consistent and the best players in the world the difference between the players in europe and the players we see here isn't just talent it's at the level of which they can frequently do the talented things they do. They're consistent. Um, and it's very difficult. So when you talk about these homegrowns and maintaining themselves, it's the same thing. It's easy to get there. It's not easy to stay there. And this goes at every single level across the way. Estuviste hablando de que Sendejas escogió el, el camino más difícil, que sería el Team USA, right? para poder eh, llegar a su objetivo en vez de escoger a, a, a la selección mexicana. Yo hoy en día, la verdad es que creo que tiene más oportunidades Team USA de hacer algo, de lograr algo a mediano plazo que, que la selección mexicana. ¿no? Eh, mi pregunta ahora va en el sentido de, ¿tú sientes de la misma manera? Ya que jugaste en la Liga MX y, y en la MLS, conoces ambos mundos, ¿Hablas de lo colectivo o lo de individual, individual o, o para entrar al, al once titular? Ahí te va, ahí te va. Yo creo, a ver, si sí tienes toda la razón, yo creo que a lo mejor en, en lo individual pudiera ser más asequible algo con Team USA. Que le falta conectarse, también es cierto, ¿no? Pero creo que una vez conectado Team USA, ¡pum! Va a convertirse en un cohete, yo lo creo. Para la selección mexicana yo lo veo muy difícil, porque lo hemos visto año tras año, y ahora una decepción en Qatar, ¿no? Eh, muy fuerte y okay. que viene arrastrándose desde el Mundial pasado. Bueno, es que el colectivo puede ser que tiene más proyección en la selección de Estados Unidos porque el pool es más amplio y, y puede competir por más cosas. ¿Por dónde está el pool? Aún tienen que jugar, es 11 contra 11, ya sabemos todo ese rollo, ¿no? Eh, pero para entrar al panorama de, de la selección de Estados Unidos, el 11 titular, si quiere jugar de extremo, pues hay... Echate un pleito, echate un pique con Christian Pulisic, echate un pique con Giovanni Reina, echate un pique con Timothy Weah, que por cierto anotó un gol en el Mundial, con Brendan Harrison, que juega en la Premier League, eh, con, con los otros jugadores talentosos que juegan estilo 10, que el próximo técnico no va a usar en 10 y tal vez los pone por la banda. Jordi Mihailovic, que, que está jugando bastante bien con AZ eh, en, en la RDBC. Eh, Taylor Booth, que la está rompiendo en la RDBC. Eh, 
échate un pique con ellos. O quieres jugar al medio campo, bueno, échate un pique con Yunes Musa, que juega en Valencia y lo quiere eh, medio mundo. Eh, o con Weston McKinney, que es uno de los jugadores pilares de la selección. O Lucas de la Torre, que la está rompiendo eh, en Celta, que ahora está de titular, eh, que le ha ido bastante bien, eh, etcétera, etcétera. Eh, es difícil decir, bueno, sí, te puede ir bien, sí, si, te puedes, si puedes llegar, si puedes mantenerte ahí. Y si no, ves el otro lado, puede ser que México fracasó en el último Mundial, pero igual México yo creo que va a estar bien por lo que puede competir a, igual que lo que puede competir Estados Unidos. Hasta creo que México tiene oportunidades de ganar la nación y la, y la Copa Oro por cómo está la selección de Estados Unidos hoy en día sin, sin su dirección ni, ni liderazgo eh, eh, en ese rol. Está echando un pique con ¿quién? Charlie Rodríguez, Luis Romo, eh, ¿quién, ¿quién más te gusta? Uriel Antuna, Diego Laines, Viejo Alvarado, Tecatito que tal vez está por salida, no jugando, no jugado Tecatito que en 200 algo días, Chucky Lozano que no va a ser eterno, eh, sí creo que es más accesible tener un poco más de éxito con la selección mexicana, pero lo que la gente no se da cuenta con lo de Sendejas es eligió y te lo puedo decir porque he vivido ambas culturas y tengo el distinto privilegio de, 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 de ser México estadounidense, México americano, o sea tengo dos claro. culturas, algo bastante lindo. Eh, identifico con ambas. Eh, cuando el amor y el respeto es casi igual o es, es, es dividido, como puede ser dividido el corazón de, de uno de esos jugadores, de repente es una decisión de otros factores, ¿no? Eh, claro. ¿dónde, siento, ¿Dónde me siento a gusto? Hablando de, 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 del estilo futbolístico, eh, cómo está el pool, cómo me tratan, etcétera, etcétera. Él estaba ya en el sistema de México. Puede ser que jugó la sub-17 con Christian Police, con Haji Wright, con Brandon Vázquez, con Tyler Adams, Weston McKinney, Lucas de la Torre, pero decidió jugar tres partidos hace un año con la selección de México. Tres partidos en que le castiga FIFA a la selección de México. Claro. Fue el trato de la federación, el engaño de la federación, quisieron manipular la situación antes de jugar contra Puebla en la liguilla llegaron justo antes de pisar el camión del equipo el camión del equipo le dicen eh Ale, ¿cómo estás? por favor firma este papel es una intención que nos dice que estás comprometido con nosotros y era el one time switch, quisieron engañarlo aquí está el one time switch, fírmalo Alejandro Sendejas siendo el hombre inteligente que es dice espérate, perdón, estoy por jugar un partido de club no de selección, deja que se lo lleve mi representación, se lo lleve mi agente, mis, mi familia, lo vemos, lo hablamos y luego decidimos, no, fírmalo, no pasa nada. Se dio cuenta que fue un engaño que quisieron manipular la situación y ponerle el one time switch ahí para firmar y bueno, le dejó un sabor muy malo en la boca y creo que es entendible. Eh, eso también es factor del por qué Alejandro Sendejas se decide por eh, la selección de Estados Unidos. Interesante. Totalmente, totalmente. Sí, 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 porque eso no, no, no lo sabía, pero interesante saber eso. Bueno, no lo digas a nadie, Dani, por favor. No, nunca. Nosotros cuatro. Sí, no, nunca. Que no, no, que no, no salga eso, de aquí. No, 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 eso no sale de acá. Sí. Y esto es público porque, porque, porque <risa> <risa> esto es público porque en su tiempo, eh, en su tiempo, tu DN, nuestros colegas de tu DN, eh, Gibran Araige, eh, dijeron que era iba a haber un convenio con la selección, la federación más bien de Estados Unidos y de México, FMF, en donde estos jugadores eh, que tienen la posibilidad de representar a México y Estados Unidos iban a firmar una intención en dónde, para ya no jugar a ambos lados, ¿no? No sé ni dónde empezar con eso, legalmente, ¿cómo puedes obligar eso? No, no está bien visto bajo los ojos de FIFA, y ustedes digan lo que quieran de FIFA, pero sería una locura. Hablo yo con la federación de Estados Unidos, ¿de qué estás hablando? Jamás podemos o podríamos nosotros obligar eh, dicho formato, dicho eh, contrato. Eh, y, y fue el one time switch. No fue una declaración de intención, fue el one time switch que quisieron ponerle al frente de, de Alejandro Sendejas. Así que por culpa de eso, ahí, ahí sabemos por qué se... Se una de las la razones. De Estados Unidos, una de, 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 de las razones. Bueno, oye, pero Dani, déjame, bueno, yo les, les, les cuento. Eh, mi, mi, mi particular punto de, de vista y de experiencia, que inclusive, eh, como, como prensa, cuando tú vas a cubrir Team USA, 
a cuando vas a cubrir la selección mexicana es algo totalmente diferente. O sea, empezando por cómo está bien estructurado y organizado eh, un media day, ¿no? Tú sabes perfectamente a qué hora va a estar el jugador, eh, en dónde va a estar y cuánto tiempo va a estar. En la selección mexicana es un desmadre, es una incógnita, ¿no? Entonces, y no solamente me refiero a selecciones, sino cómo se maneja el fútbol tanto en México como en Estados Unidos. Creo que tiene Sin una duda. manera mucho más sí. eh, efectiva y eficaz el Team USA. Y creo que eso les va a llevar eventualmente bueno, es, a, a generar es algo más, bueno, ¿no? Es más Estructurado. profesional. Quiero decir profesional en ese sentido porque no hay este miedo de que nos quieren chingar. ¿Sí me entiendes? Y creo que en el fútbol mexicano hay un miedo entre eh, los jugadores y los directores técnicos, los equipos de que nos quieren chingar. Entonces, como existe esta inseguridad, eh, quieren manejar todo, quieren manipular todo. Eh, yo fui a, al Mundial 2018 eh, en Rusia a cubrir la selección de México y me pusieron un en un WhatsApp de, de medios, un chat de medios, donde Israel Márquez, el, el coordinador de, o el jefe de prensa de la selección mexicana, eh, daba como alertas o, o vamos a hacer tal cosa. Eh, y, y, y era complicado, era complicado hablar con los jugadores porque solamente te, TV Azteca o Televisa eh, tenían acceso a ellos, tener algo realmente informativo, estructurado, eh, tiempos bien organizados, y creo que justo hace poco la selección mexicana hizo algo en el estadio del Galaxy, un Media Day. Fue la primera vez que yo recuerdo que hacen algo así. Y ya está cambiando poco por poco lo que es la estructura mexicano, mexicana con esto. Eh, eh, Tato Noriega, el presidente de, de Monterrey, vi en su Instagram, sus stories, que estaba haciendo un Media Day de Monterrey previo al clásico. Y tenían estaciones y tenían como... Eh, los jugadores en cada estación y iban cambiando de estación con ciertos eh, miembros de, los, de la prensa, no importa, no importa si tenías derechos o no, qué tan grande o pequeño era, era estructurado, estructurado de una buena manera. Eh, y para mí eso viene de acá, eh, eso no digo del fútbol, viene de la estructura de, de, de los deportes norteamericanos, es lo que hace la NBA, es lo que hace la NFL, es lo que hace MLB. Eh, es algo más profesional para atender los medios que al final del día mandan o, o, o comunican tu mensaje de quién es el club y quién son los jugadores al público. Entiendo, entiendo. Bueno, una, una preguntita que you were talking about some Instagram posts. I was, I was kind of, you know, looking at your Instagram posts. I noticed one of your pin, pin uh, IGs is with a picture with Mike Tyson. And I'm just wondering... Uh, of all the people that you've got to interview, because I'm, you know, I'm, I know that with, in all the shows you participated in, is there any one person that you've interviewed or you take a picture with that you've been starstruck? Uh, <laughs> no, no me digas uh, a mí, el culo. Eh, no, aparte, no, de no, mí, no. aparte de mí, otro. George Fields, que, lo, bueno, en Aura nunca estaba en el estudio con nosotros y, y, y tan guaraches, que era impresionante, you know? o sea, <laughs> viene siempre en guaraches George Fields de todos lados, que siempre me dio como que What's going on here, George? ¿Qué está pasando? Oye, eh, pero son caros, ¿eh? Son caros esos sí. guaraches. Y te, y, y te los acuerdas, te acuerdas que son caros. O sea, te va a decir, hey. No son, son como los de Nico ni los de Dani. O sea, de, no, no, de, no, de no, Walmart. no, 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 no. Son caros. Eh, yo hago, tengo este programa en ESPN Deportes y me abro nunca. Y somos todos los deportes y como cultura popular. Entonces, de repente nos tocan eh, figuras importantes. Eh, me acuerdo de tres. El primero era eh, Kylian Mbappé. Kylian Mbappé eh, fue a un hotel aquí a, en Santa Mónica. Eh, lo entrevisté eh, y me acuerdo, eh, o sea, sabía de quién era Kylian Mbappé y lo que era como futbolista. Esto fue hace como tres años. Recién ganó un mundial, eh, etcétera, etcétera. Pero no me di cuenta hasta ese momento lo grande que era Kylian Mbappé en términos mediáticos. O sea, tenía un equipo total. No podíamos seguridad por todos lados, no podíamos preguntar, nos dieron una lista de cosas que no podíamos preguntar. Eh, me di cuenta de lo que era Kylian Mbappé o lo que iba a ser en ese momento. Un, un corporativo, ya lo manejaban como una empresa, Kylian. Eh, eso fue muy interesante para mí. El segundo fue eh, justo antes de la muerte de Kobe Bryant. Creo que fue uno de los últimos, de las últimas entrevistas de Kobe Bryant. Eh, lo entrevisté eh, en el estadio de Bank of California en ese tiempo, en el estadio de LAFC. Y yo crecí aficionado a los Lakers y me acuerdo como que 
es Kobe Bryant, o sea, y hablando de fútbol con Kobe, fue algo muy divertido para mí. Y el último fue precisamente de lo que estás hablando, Mike Tyson. Eh, Mike Tyson mide como 5 pies, 10 pulgadas, lo que mido yo, pero es un tanque. Y me acuerdo que era la primera vez que yo he estado en la presencia de alguien y como me pongo nervioso, no, por, no porque estoy starstruck, no porque digo, ah, que es una figura, es una estrella. Sí soy aficionado del, del boxeo y obviamente dice quién es y lo que ha hecho, pero porque es de las pocas veces que ha estado yo en un cuarto con alguien y digo, me puede matar. Y te lo digo bien. O sea, lo estaba entrevistando, estaba muy tranquilo y, y muy como que, no, ya, ya no soy ese tipo de persona, soy muy tranquilo, no, no sé qué tanto... Y al final de la entrevista le digo, hey, champ, can I get a picture? No, es una aficionado enorme, por favor, una foto. Claro que sí. Y me da la mano después de la foto y mi mano, entra su mano y, y, y te, por Dios, era como cuatro veces el tamaño de, 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 de mi mano. Y me agarra, me aprieta la mano y me trae como cerca de él, así. Y nada más me ve así. Como que no me te dio un beso, ¿verdad? Que, no, pero me da el mensaje <risa> como mental de... De aquí matar. estoy. Sí. Y ahí sí, o sea, o sea sí, sí era como Mike Tyson, the champion here. Pero fue de las pocas veces que yo como que, ay, cabrón. Mira, Herc, Herc, él, él te puede decir que uh, he's not like that anymore, pero andar a robarle el, el tigre como le hicieron no, en, en Hangover. Sí, hangover. Y, y vas a ver cómo te va a dejar una así. Vas o o en, el, en el vuelo que estaba con esa persona que, que no lo dejaba de molestar. O sea, ese sí. También, ¿Viste? ¿Viste? No lo dejaba de molestar. Oye, pero se, se contuvo, ¿no? Se, lo puedo haber matado igual. The champ, the champ. <laughs> the champ, the champ. All right. All right, so before we let you go here, and, and, and we want to thank you so much for coming on, we want to get really quickly into MLS. Um, you know, there, there's with the new Apple thing, there's not a lot of a lot of uh, games that are accessible to to basically the public unless you subscribe. So there's a couple free games a week. Um, I think they're doing a better job about that. But who's your favorite to uh, to win the MLS Cup this this year? I think there are two strong candidates. Uh, the obvious one is LAFC. Everybody's going to say LAFC. It's it's crazy how they ended up losing Chicho Arango, and, and all of a sudden you think they got better. They lost Gareth Bell, Chicho Arango. Uh, they may lose some more players. Sin Fuentes could be the next to go to Europe. Um, but knowing John Thornton and knowing LAFC, they're going to have something up their sleeve. And they're going to have some signings come summertime, and the team's going to get stronger. Um, they look like a good team. But my pick is Philly. I like Philly. Philly's not a flashy team. Philly is a team um, that knows what they're about, that knows who they are. They know how to win. They're very offensive. Gazdag should have been an MVP candidate last year. Um, they had another MVP candidate in Andre Blake. I know he's injured at the moment, but he's still one of the best goalkeepers uh, in North America. You've got a head coach that was the coach of the year last year in Jim Curtin, who knows how to get the best out of his players. Um, in multiple systems, they play a brand that's chaotic but attractive to the eye going forward. I mentioned Gazdag, uh, the leadership of Alejandro Bedoya. Uh, they had two Defender of the Year candidates in Glesnes and, and Jack Elliott, and they got stronger this year. It's, it's, I think it's theirs. I think we're going to see a repeat of last year's MLS Cup. There you have it. There you have it. Uh, so, so before we let you go, I know Danny said that was one of the last questions. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, there's a lot of rumors going on now, and primarily because we live in Miami, you know, uh, we're going to get the new stadium and all that. The team is growing little by little. But there's a lot of rumors going on about Messi maybe coming to the MLS. Uh, and I wanted, to, I wanted to get your take on that, primarily because, you know, we, we know, we know who Messi is. But no, uh, don't lie, primarily because you're Argentinian and you want to see him <laughs> in the pink and black. Let, let's be honest. Of course, of course, of course. Que me ve, bobo, que me ve. Que mira, bobo, que mira, bobo. Yeah, What's your take yeah. on that? What's uh, so, your take on that? So, Messi has a house in, in Miami. And everybody's like, oh, he's got a house. He's coming. All these footballers have a house in Miami. Uh, it's just a reality. They, they like to vacation there. And, and if I'm looking at Messi right now, a few trains of thoughts with Major League Soccer and Messi. Let's concentrate on Messi really quickly. What else does he have to prove? What does he got to do? Absolutely nothing. He's won everything. 
He doesn't have to prove anything to anybody. So him staying in Europe for another Champions League doesn't do anything for him. Doesn't do anything for for anybody for him for for them to feel like oh he finally did it. He's done everything. PSG. He's not going to win anything with PSG important like the Champions League going forward. You may lose Mbappe. Neymar's always injured. Um, if you look at where he could potentially go, could he go to a Saudi Arabia and, and make hundreds of millions like Cristiano? Maybe, but why would he want that media circus? Why would he want to be with Cristiano again? So all, all – I mean, he's not going to go back to Argentina. You saw what happened at uh, his wife's, his suegro's uh, supermarket and how it was uh, shot up. And, and you know, uh, there's organized... Hiciste enojar al nene. Yeah, sorry. Hiciste enojar al nene con tu respuesta. Yeah. So <laughs> all, all odds point to point to Major League Soccer in Miami where he can be comfortable, where his wife and kids can be comfortable, where, you know, uh, it may be an interesting proposition for him. Now, this is where I will talk about the proposition to get Major League Soccer. In order to bring a Lionel Messi type of player, you're going to have to do a David Beckham type of deal. David Beckham came to Major League Soccer in 2007, and he got $250 million in five years. That's $50 million a year uh, distributed in many different ways with Adidas, jerseys, merchandising, whatnot, gate, etc. And he also had a clause in his contract where if he – finished a five-year term, he would activate a trigger that said he could purchase a major league soccer team at $25 million as long as it wasn't New York and he had to find a stadium for it. He plays the five years to purchase this team, which is now Inter-Miami at $25 million. And Inter-Miami is going to easily be worth half a billion dollars right now, if not more. And wait till they build that stadium to be worth more. So he's now parlayed that into ownership. They essentially have to do something similar. This is where Apple comes in. Apple has an opt-out of the contract on the TV deal with Major League Soccer if they don't meet subscriptions. Major League Soccer right now has created a network, a TV network. They're the ones doing the production for all the games. It's not Apple. Apple's providing the platform. So they gave him $250 million a year, but over half of that, like $130 million of that, is going to go to production. You're playing production. You're playing talent. You're playing travel. You're playing all these different things. Uh, it eats up a chunk of your change. So you're dependent on this subscription-based plan if you're Major League Soccer. And what's going to drive subscriptions? A star like Messi. So you desperately need Messi in Major League Soccer right now to kick off this new campaign. And maybe a way to get Messi to Major League Soccer would be offering something like the David Beckham deal with ownership, a stake in Inter Miami, or... Uh, a new franchise, maybe Las Vegas, because we know Jorge uh, Messi, his father, was in Las Vegas with the commissioner, uh, Don Garber, in the Gold Cup final, U.S. versus Mexico. Maybe that would be the case. Or Apple comes in and they offer him options, off of subscriptions in this MLS season pass deal. But you need somebody like Messi if you're Major League Soccer to drive those subscriptions. Perfecto, mi Hercules Gomez. Hércules, oye, muchas gracias por haber estado con nosotros, por haber compartido los secretos, que nadie se va a enterar, te lo prometemos, nadie, solo Dani, Nico y yo, tranquilo. Estamos entre, entre, entre amigos, confianza. Estamos entre brothers, no te preocupes. Eh, ¿Escuchó Federación Mexicana? ¿Lo tienen grabado? Perfecto, te tienen grabado. Eh, oye, rápido, quiero decirte unas palabras y lo primerito que se te venga a la mente me lo contestas, o sea, solo una palabra, ¿no? Por ejemplo, te voy a decir zapato y tú me dices pie, ¿va? Rapiditas, sin pensarlas. Ahí te va la primera. LA. Vida. USA. Eh, futuro. México. Cultura. Tacos. ¿Cuándo? <risa> Tú dime. <risa> Santos. Uf, familia. Puebla. Esa no puede faltar. Historia. Eh, World Cup. Sueño. Hércules. El presente. Perfecto. 
Espectacular, hermanito. Espectacular. Y la última pregunta es, brevemente, ¿por qué te pusieron Hércules? Porque había muchas drogas en los ochentas. <risa> Muy bien. ¿Y de pequeño cómo te decían? Pon un ejemplo. <risa> eh, pequeño Hércules, te decían. Little Hercules. <risa> I'm just kidding, my friend. I'm just kidding. Ah, no, me, no me entendiste, o sea... Me quisiste alburear y te alburé. Sí, 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 me albureaste, me albureaste, me albureaste. Un a cero, un a cero en este partido. Ganaste, Hercules. Siempre perdido, Tony, ¿eh? Siempre eh, perdido, Tony. No me acordé que convivió mucho tiempo con jugadores mexicanos y... No. Ah, es... LA, LA, baby. LA, LA. Me falta barrio, me falta barrio, Hercules. Mucho, Algo más, mucho, chicos, mucho. muchas gracias. No, 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 mucho no, barrio, hermano. La verdad no, que... Man. We thank you so much, Herc. We had a great time. It was a great chat. So, so we want to wish you the best in, in the upcoming things that you have in your life. I appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, all right. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Un abrazo, hermanito. Gracias.